Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. One of the Pharisees, called Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, he said, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform these signs of yours unless God were with him. Jesus answered, In very truth, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. But how can someone be born when already old? asked Nicodemus. Can one enter a mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, In very truth, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born from water and spirit. Flesh can give only birth only to flesh. It is spirit that gives birth to spirit. You ought, to be, you ought not to be astonished when I say you all must be born again. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you do not where it, know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born from the spirit. How is this possible? Asked Nicodemus. You, a teacher of Israel and ignorant of such things, said Jesus. In very truth, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, and yet you all reject our testimony. If you do not believe me when I talk to you about earthly things, how are you to believe me should I talk about things of heaven? No one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up in order that everyone who has faith may in him have eternal life. God so loves the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who has faith in him may not perish but have eternal life. It was not to judge the world that God sent his Son into the world, but that through him the world might be saved. The Gospel of the Lord. as you celebrate your 300th anniversary. This is a time in Boston I won't soon forget. I also want to acknowledge the many family members who are visiting from the Boston suburbs in this place today. I may have the most southern of names, uh, but I married a Massachusetts girl, uh, so my taste can't be that bad. In July of 2001, uh, do you know where your nine-year-old is? That should have been a commercial for our family. If you're a member of my household, my parents chose to look the other way as my kid brother and I watched the trashy animated comedy show Family Guy. In the episode we watched that summer night, the all-American cartoon family, the Griffins, are headed to Fenway for a day at the ballpark. Chris, the eldest son, makes a sign from our gospel lesson today that says John 3.16. But it turns out no one in the family can figure out what John 3.16 actually says until Brian the dog looks it up in the Bible. Turns out, at least in these parts, John 3.16 is translated simply and directly, Go Socks. 
Today we hear from the gospel lesson, though, that there is a, this is one of the most quoted pieces of scripture. You see it on signs at Fenway and at other baseball stadiums and at basketball games. You, you see it that, that this is something that we talk about a lot as a church, but often know very little about. Certainly in the New Testament, it ranks as one of the most well-known uh, verses that even Episcopalians could quote from memory. It ranks in the annals of Scripture alongside the 23rd Psalm or Genesis 1-1 that like many verses in our Bible, it is abused and it is misused by many for the sake of their own idea of what salvation might mean. Luckily for Episcopalians, though, and those who follow the Revised Common Lectionary, today we hear how the larger picture of John 3 is painted. Nicodemus is a religious leader and he comes under the cover of night to see if Jesus might actually be who he says he is. Nicodemus, might, like many, had heard uh, that this rabbi from Nazareth was around causing trouble. And he, like many of us, wants to meet Jesus even if it is costly. What Nicodemus didn't realize that night was that even his life's trajectory would forever be changed by an encounter with Jesus. That's always how it happens, isn't it? We're minding our own business, and then rumblings of the Spirit show up and meet us and refuse to leave us where we are. You see what compels me about John 3.16? Isn't John 3.16 at all? It's John 3.17. What is much more compelling is that God did not come into this world to judge the world, or as other translations say, condemn the world, but that the world might be freed or saved through Him. John 3.16 is easy. It's who's in and who's out to some people. But to suggest in John 3.17 that there is more to the story is far more complicated than some of us are willing to admit. I much prefer to serve a God on a reconnaissance mission for saints and sinners alike, not a scorched earth mission to destroy What scares me most about the loudest of God's followers today is that there are certain that God will destroy and tear down those things which God created. God will burn it all up and send it to hell, they say. But the God I've come to know does not destroy that which God loves and that which God came into the world to say. The next time you're at Fenway, Maybe you should have John 3.17 rather than John 3.16. Because John 3.17, even with 16 in tow, are reminders of the world as it is and what it could be. John 3.17 provides the motive by which we see God's work and God's grace enacted in the world. God did not come to send you all or me to hell. God came to bring us nearer. Proximity is what God is all about. God would rather be near you, with you, for you, than to send you away. What makes me a Christian isn't the promise that God will save you but the promise that God will change me. The reality is made evident in John 3.17 as we see the shifting of gears from salvation to sanctification. God does not condemn. God saves by changing us into the glory that is yet to be revealed. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul writes that God will bring things to completion for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. To me, that is a rich and abiding promise that God meets us here, but God does not intend to leave us here. And that intent is also incredibly true 
for Christ's church dispersed throughout the world in Christ Church Boston, the Old North Church. In the past years, through the work of historians and theologians who have confronted and are confronting a legacy of this national landmark that has not always been heard or easily examined, the slaveholding past of this place is something you and our nation must reckon with as many families, including the Lee family, including my family, are reckoning with. But I love that line in in the Methodist communion liturgy when it says, free us, we pray, for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. To me, that is in the same vein of John 3, 17. This church may have a past, But if we reckon with it and atone for this past, we can be assured that in 300 more years, there will be a church on Salem Street. Old North Church, I don't say this to belittle you or to demean you. I say this because you are a national church. You have been for much of this history a literal beacon of light when the forces that seek to prevail against our country are near. Right now, there are people in our communities that are looking to churches like Old North for both assurance and for promise, for both John 3.16 and John 3.17. You need to light the lanterns once more and say that there have been times in our past where we have failed, But we are assured that by making things right that have been wronged, God will redeem and restore the years, as the prophet Joel foretold many years ago. In your 300th year, in 2023, it could be true what the poet Tennyson said, though much is taken, much much abides. Though we are not now the strength in old days that moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts. We need some heroes in this church. We all need Old North to take charge and be a hero for our nation and for our world once more. I attended a Duke Divinity School for seminary Uh, Many of you will be happy to hear, as I was last night, that Duke beat Carolina. And for those of you suddenly worried, I have lectured and preached at Harvard, so that basically cancels out the blue devil in me. But at Duke, we have this magnificent Pentecost window, depicting the coming of the Holy Spirit of the Apostles at Pentecost. Every year since the Westbrook building at Duke has been built, Materials from the stained glass that made up the stained glass window are fashioned into small glass crosses. Each year, a different color is hewn out to show the fullness of the diversity of the divinity school. In 2017, the year I graduated, the color of the cross was dark blue. Now the crosses are made just two hours from Duke University's campus at Statesville Stained Glass, which happens to be just five minutes from my house. Now, despite Duke's best efforts and calls and mailings, I cannot give millions to the endowment or their fund. Yet, when Duke Divinity's chaplain, Megan Vincent, called me the other day and asked if I might be willing to pick up the crosses and drive them from Statesville East to Durham, I thought that might be something I could do. A few weeks back, I took my youngest daughter, Phoenix, with me to pick up the stained glass crosses from the studio after I had picked her up from school. Something you should know about Athena and Phoenix, who are in church school today, is they outshine their dad in every way. That was clear that day in Statesville. Phoenix, our resident four-year-old expert on everything, began a conversation with Dennis, the stained glass maker, about the shop and all that he had in it. She began telling this older man about her many sets of grandparents, 
From Nona and Krabby to Gigi and Pepe to Mama Jane and Pawpaw and Grandma Roberta. Now this gave the stained glass artist pause, so I felt the need to explain to him that Phoenix and Athena were adopted into the Lee family in July of 2021 after a lengthy process of preparation and excitement. He heard the sacred story of our family, of the challenges that Athena and Phoenix had faced in their few short years, and how they had risen to meet them with more grace than most adults could ever muster. Dennis's face turned electric. You could just see it in his eyes. And he asked me to wait while he went back into his office. And he took two crosses. One for Phoenix, and one for Athena, and handed me to hold them for safekeeping. He remarked, the children have encountered a cross, but they found God there. Isn't that the hope of Lent, my friends? We are on a collision course with death, destruction, and desolation. Yet God, in God's infinite love, sought not to condemn us or to send us to hell, but to sanctify us. Lent is ultimately about salvation through sanctification. It is knowing the story, but equally knowing the author. It is about encountering a cross and finding God there. As I handed Phoenix her light blue cross that I have here today, she looked at me and she said, Dad, this cross is heavier than I thought it would be. Can you help me? I chuckled only as a parent could, knowing that my sermon had written itself. And I took her cross back so that she might be free to be a kid again. Now, church, you're a church. I don't have to spell that out for you, do I? We are given a holy and eternal parent who knows that despite the weight of our cross, of our cross, God can do immensely more than we could ever imagine by taking our cross away from us. God knows only as a parent can the trajectory of the cross is not the definition of who his children are because God is not a condemning and abusive parent. God is a parent who loves and adores God's children. It's like that line in that hymn, God as a mother doth speed, spreading God's, the wings of grace o'er thee. God is ready. God is calling. Pick up your child, cross, dear child. You don't have to go this road of Lent alone. And when it gets heavy, thanks be to God we have a parent for that. All glory, honor, and power be to the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen.